think it's important to mention the fact that the, the interest of such a, a working party is that we try to exchange views and questions and, uh, and responses, if any, as uh, vividly as possible, uh, because the idea is really to have a brainstorming which would be as, uh, I would say, rich as possible, with perhaps and I'm speaking under the control of our rapporteur, Hélène, uh, perhaps with some preliminary professional conclusion in a number of domains where you would, we would think that there is some kind of consensus or emerging consensus. So, we, uh, the, 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 I would say, uh, re prerequisite for uh, this uh, brainstorming to be as fruitful as possible would be that the first intervention of the speakers uh, would be very short, as short as possible. I would suggest uh, three, four minutes uh, to mention the main issues that they think, or the main question that they think would be worth examining. And, and then we have uh, a lot of time, perhaps, uh, to, to, again, exchange views between the panelists and uh, with the uh, participant in the working party. So thank you again very much for having accepted to speak. Let me mention the speakers uh, once again, uh, because, uh, because you have already their uh, resume uh, in the documents. Uh, I have to thank uh, Bertrand Bar Bradé, Badré, pardon, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> uh, he's been uh, financial uh, uh, director of Credit Agricole, uh, vice president uh, of, uh, not vice president, but uh, general director and uh, financial director of the World Bank. So he has a very uh, extraordinary experience. And now he came from, as he told me, macro to micro, and he's the CEO of uh, Blue Like an Orange, Sustainable Capital, all a program. <laughs> uh, then we uh, will have, I, I am mentioning them in alphabetic order and also in the order I suggest for the in very short introduction I already mentioned. Daniel Dayanou, uh, pres president of the uh, Fiscal uh, Council and uh, councillor of the governor uh, for uh, all the uh, Euro area affairs. And he, he was uh, also director of the National Bank of Romania. Jeff Frieden uh, is a professor in the department of, uh, of um, the Harvard University, the government, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, department of the Harvard University and has been very, very influential in many university and in many, many domain. Uh, I'm sorry because I translate poorly <laughs> instead of, of having the, I have the French version, so correct me. Uh, the School of Government, I should have said that. Department of Government. Uh, Akinari Ori, uh, ancient member of the uh, Bank of Japan, Deputy Governor of Bank of Japan, and uh, now member of the uh, board of the Canon Institute for Global Studies, Akinori is uh, like Jeff, like Bertrand, a uh, speaker that uh, we are hearing often here in this working party. Now we, we have also Hur Kyun Wook, uh, who uh, was ambassador of Korea in the OECD, uh, is uh, uh, president of the board, um, which, who's uh, also a counselor of the Bureau of Economic Research of the ASEAN and uh, was uh, Vice Minister of Strategy and Finance in the government. Also has an experience in the IMF. I mentioned that en passant, <laughs> on the recommendation of, of John. André Lévy-Langue uh, is professor, Associate Professor in Finance at the University of Paris-Dauphine, former CEO of Paribas, uh, eminent banker, and also president of the board of IFRI. Uh, John Lipsky, Peterson uh, Distinguished Scholar at uh, the Nizza School of Advanced International Studies, John Hopkins. Uh, he was the first managing director, deputy managing director of the IMF. 
and uh, he was an he is an eminent banker <laughs> with a, a lot of experience in finance and um, private banking too. And Hélène Ray, professor of economy in the London Business School, uh, she's a member of the Economic Commission of the French Nation and also a member of the High Council of Stability, uh, Financial Stability, very well known as an eminent professor uh, all over the world. So thank you so much again for your presence. Uh, it's a privilege. We are all conscious that it is a privilege. And um, I will, without any further ado, give the floor to Bertrand. You have the floor, Bertrand. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jean-Claude. I will, I will try to be brief since I'm, I'm going to be a little uh, on the side of, of the main questions probably, although I think what I'm going to put on the table uh, is likely to be central for, for the coming years. Uh, I'd like to touch base on the question that has been addressed this year in many places, the reset of capitalism. So there are a number of things which have happened this year. Is it for real or is it just a fade? It's early days to say. Uh, people have reacted to the business roundtable call end of August. You had the cover page of The Economist also, which was somewhat misleading when you compare to the content on what are companies for. You had the initiatives of President Macron uh, at the G7 called the Business for Inclusive Growth with the OECD, led by Emmanuel Faber, the CEO of Danone. Uh, and you have the growing importance of uh, impact, uh, sustainable development goals, uh, related investments, etc., emphasized by the fact that the big players are moving. I mean, Moody's has bought one of the non-financial or extra-financial rating agencies in France. ISS has done the same in Germany. S&P just appointed a global head for extra-financial ratings, and so, forth, and so on and so forth. So there is something happening, I think, and it's big because of the pressure from mostly consumers, somewhat, sometimes investors, uh, but I think it's still fragile and it's still prone to washing. So you heard the expression green washing. I discovered a few weeks ago, you, you know, for those of you who don't know, these are the sustainable development goals, and now you call it rainbow washing, which is a diversification. So you still have on the one hand a lot of goodwill with, with some CEOs, institutions, which tend to do the great things, um, but there are no standards. There are no real definitions, so you can basically call whatever you want. And depending on how you mention it, you can say there are 30 trillion of dollars invested in ESG-related products. Or if you're very strict, you say it's less than $500 billion, which have an impact in a way or another. And both are probably true. At a moment where people realize that capitalism, as it is working today, is unlikely to address the climate change issue and the social inequality issue naturally. You need a little bit of push. So is the glass half full or half empty? I don't know. But I think it's on top of the questions that are being raised by the zero rate environment or negative rates environment, which can be the worst or the best of things. It can be the worst uh, if people are paralyzed and unable to, to do new things or take risks, etc., which so far seems to be the norm. Or it can be the best if it forces people to think out of the box and realize that we just discussed that, okay, you can, you can get minus 0.5% if you buy European bonds, but you can get 10 or 12% if you do the right thing in Africa or Latin America. I'm sorry, I'm a little biased in that. So, um, so I think it's more than just a, a coincidence. I think there are, again, a growing concern after the crisis, people realize that we have not really addressed the root causes of the financial crisis. Ten years down the road, we're still there. At the same time, we're focused on climate issues and social issues is gaining traction. Uh, in a world where there is still a big distrust for finance, so it might be a nice way to regain the trust of the consumer and investors by doing the right things. Not sure we're getting there. But so the point is, how can we go beyond uh, a fashion? Uh, beyond marketing, beyond confusing products, between, beyond traditional corporate social responsibility. And basically, to be consistent with what we agreed in 2015, so in 2015 we agreed on climate, except one country now, but we agreed on the sustainable development goals, including climate, actually, and as far as I know, the US are still part of the sustainable development goal framework. So we have agreed on the framework, on the roadmap, we have not discussed the financial system to get there. And we have to overcome a number of issues. It's still a very complex issue. It's a complex issue to measure. Uh, it's a complex issue to rate these things. The methodologies are different. The expectations are different. Uh, vested interests are different. Uh, the data, I mean, are, are, are very difficult. It's very easy to say, yes, let's do the good things, and then try to get the data to confirm you've done the good things is something difficult. There is also an issue 
between emerging market and advanced economy. Uh, I mean, trying to invest in emerging markets, you don't want to impose a new uh, Washington consensus, which is on sustainability now. We are back and now we have a great idea. You do this. Well, sometimes you have some resistance. Um, and you will have probably some mis-selling issues. Think of Volkswagen. Volkswagen was considered a, a highlight of ESG before the Dieselgate scandal. And suddenly people say, well, God, my God, I, I got a lot of Dieselgate, of uh, Volkswagen shares and they were ESG and I felt comfortable and actually they were not. So to fill the glass to the end, I think uh, we have to accept this diversity of approach today. Uh, even if skepticism still dominates, I think uh, this is how we will create accountability. We have to, to go beyond the nice green bonds, to go beyond the nice uh, uh, social bonds, etc. And we need, at some stage, and I finish with that, uh, to start working on the system. And actually, what do I mean with that? And it's, again, it's a, it's a 20 years uh, perspective. It's really, and I'm going to be very simplistic, to move from the Milton Friedman approach to the social purpose of business is to make profit, or with nice variation is to make profit for shareholders. Also, he added, to be fair, that you need to take into consideration societal acceptance of that. That uh, tend to forget that important element. How do we move from that to what uh, Colin Meyer in particular in Oxford say, the social purpose of business is to find profitable solutions for the planet and its people. So it's not profit as an end to an end, but profit as a means to an end, which means entering into the nitty gritty details of accounting, compensation, reporting, disclosure, regulatory framework, etc. And basically, at the end of the day, we connect capitalism with people and the territories, etc. And add a third, a third dimension uh, to the risk return traditional financial approach, which is risk return on sustainability or risk return on impact. How do we take into account the fact that we are in a finite world and we have to take this into consideration. And as I say sometimes to irritate the accountants, we have to move from a mark to market system to a mark to planet system. And my kids say, Daddy, you should create the hashtag mark to planet, which is a nice suggestion. Thank you. It is a nice conclusion too, uh, obviously. Uh, thank you very, very much indeed. I take it that it is a responsibility also of public authorities to give the appropriate, I would say, rules regulations, set of prices that would drive the decentralized decision of the private sector in the right direction without asking them to lose money because otherwise we are all lost. Thank you so much, Bertrand. Daniel, you have the floor. Thank you, Thank you President Trichet. Um, I'll try to be very brief with the, with the matrix of what I see as major developments, ongoing developments in, in the global space. Uh, some of them I touched upon last year, but it seems to me that they are more visible nowadays uh, as an age of major, major, huge disruptions. And it, 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 seemingly it's, um, it's an increasingly wild world, uh, lacking order and um, with a lot, of, a lot of fragmentation and, and dissonance in, in many respects, massive erosion of multilateralism. It's like an earthquake which is happening uh, in view of what has prevailed after the Second World War, um, the so-called liberal international order, currency and trade wars, uh, an erosion uh, of the transatlantic relationship, which is uh, quite dismaying for Europeans, but also for Americans. Um, Geopolitics very much on, on the agenda and, um, and the confrontation between the United States and, uh, and China. I mean, to listen to one former European prime minister to say that we are threatened to, to turn into a colony, either of the United, I mean, that, that is mind boggling. I mean, I, 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 it, the, wor the wording is quite, uh, I, I think it, that was not adequate. Totally inadequate. It's like saying that Australia is, is, is a colony or New Zealand. And, and those countries are not members of the European Union. I mean, I, I mean, one has to be a little bit wiser. I mean, especially having the background as a former prime minister. I, I'm very candid with you. Um, now, the shift of economic power, that's, which is inexorable, and I, I believe that at the end of the day, Americans and Chinese have to strike a deal for the sake of global common goods. Uh, fourthly, uh, there is a sense of desperation, and, and um, uh, think about um, central banks under pressure. 
um, thinking again, I mean, a new round of QEs, think again of, of uh, major fiscal stimulus. And it's true, as Olivier Blanchard said, we, are, we have a different regime now with the neutral rate uh, uh, very low, it's true, but, but I'll, I'll make a, 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 a fundamental distinction in, in, in this respect. What central banks of reserve uh, providing uh, uh, countries can do, uh, emerging economies cannot do. So it's, it's, it's a different ball game. Um, uh, shadow banking, and I'll get back to it when I have more time, but shadow banking poses enormous systemic risk. And I'm asking myself who's going to provide uh, the land of last resort function capital markets. Um, just keep in mind what happened with, in the repo market uh, in, uh, in the United States uh, um, lately. Um, now, um, climate change, I agree. It's also about uh, capitalism, our economic systems. It is very much true, but it's also something which is uh, crippling our banking sectors, huge exposure to sectors which are going to be impacted negatively by uh, by climate change. Um, climate change is an ex existential threat, probably more than artificial intelligence. And I fully agree that. And, and I, I agree that the, the business models have to change. And I, I welcome the letter of the 130 CEOs, but I don't know how much hypocrisy is there, whether they, they realize that something has to change, that the, uh, uh, companies have to respond to stakeholders, not only to shareholders. Um, so it's in our society, it's too much of a winner's take all game, the way our economic systems will function. And ultimately, that's going to bring democracy down. And, uh, and, and, and this is the fundamental threat uh, we are facing. Whether you are a right winger or a left winger, it doesn't matter. If you believe in democracy, you have to do something about it. Okay, I'll stop at it. Uh, I have more to say about digital. Li Libra for me. It's a huge challenge, a huge challenge. If parallel currencies are going to proliferate, central banks are going to lose control of their monetary policies. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you indeed very, very much, uh, Daniel. I take it that uh, one of the connection between what you said is that uh, in the McCartney analysis, where uh, those entities, uh, private entities, uh, public entities that would miss the enormous transformation that are coming might create financial risk of first magnitude. And uh, there is another way, negative way, to look at uh, what's happening and uh, the addition of uh, various financial risks. Uh, Jeff, you have the floor. Great. And so not surprisingly, since we've done this before, uh, it flows in many ways from what Danielle was saying. There are a lot of issues we could discuss, and I'm, I hope we will, in international finance. Um, international politics, international money and finance is particularly complex these days. We could talk about crisis management and whether we're prepared for another crisis, about, <clears throat> as we did in the uh, plenary session, the role of the dollar, the euro, perhaps other currencies, the politicization of finance with sanctions, how that re relates to things like the rise of China, how all of that relates to socially responsible investing. So we could talk about all of those, but I think that if we did, if we did, if we did only that, we would miss the main issue that faces international finance today not only international finance, but the international economy and anyone who believes in the desirability of an integrated international economic order. The main issue facing international finance and the international economy today is domestic and it's political. It is, as some have called it, a revolt of the masses, um, reminiscent of previous eras. To me, frankly, not that I agree with those who are representing the revolters, um, many of whom I find revolting, but it is justifiable in the sense that, that there is a response or a reaction to perceptions of that globalism or, or globalization or globalism as Donald Trump calls it has created extraordinary increases in, um, in income inequality, created pools of wealth that are undeserved, has contributed to the decline of communities, of entire regions of, of countries. This is a perception that's very widespread it's not just American, it's not just French, it's not just Brazilian, it's virtually global in for almost all of the OECD countries and many developing countries as well. And I don't think we should fool ourselves, but the reality is that there's no question, at least in my mind, that international finance is a target. 
international finance and the international economic order and everybody that's involved in it. Um, whether that target is correctly aimed or not is another matter. But we have a precedent, and the, the precedent is that of the interwar years in which mainstream political parties and mainstream political and economic actors were incapable of finding a solution to track intractable problems that, that affected the lives of millions and tens and hundreds of millions of people. And if mainstream political parties and mainstream economic actors don't find solutions, others will fill that vacuum. And I think the, the big question is, what will those in and around international financial institutions do? Um, we have an early answer in the United States when, for the first time since the 1930s, we had a pre two presidential candidates who ran on explicit campaigns, on explicit platforms of hostility to international trade, international finance, and international investment. One of those candidates won the presidency. The other one is running for it again, Bernie Sanders. Um, in response to the victory of someone who campaigned against globalism and international finance and international trade, the American international business community has essentially been silent. And the usual conclusion is, well, don't like those policies too much, but we did get tax cuts and we did get deregulation and maybe that's more important. And from the standpoint of any individual firm, that's probably true. From the standpoint of the international economic order and the international financial system, that's a terrible, terrible mistake that will lead us into, in my view, something like a repeat of the 1930s. So my question is, what are people going to do? When will the business community, when will international financial institutions start doing something about the fact that virtually every country in the world is facing, in some cases, majoritarian objections to the way the international economic and financial order is structured? Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jeff. I'm not surprised by your uh, analysis and also your, uh, I would say, call for uh, react, appropriate reaction. I, I must confess I was amazed myself to see that even Hillary, you mentioned, of course, Bernie, but even Hillary was very much signaling that they were, she would go back uh, in uh, uh, comparison with the previous uh, drive towards uh, liberalism and open market. But thank you very, very much indeed. Again, for all the participants, you take note. And what we would need would be your reaction, your questions, because we are restricting considerably. And uh, I also take uh, uh, into account the fact that you, you probably had a paper I wrote with a number of questions uh, only as a suggestion for uh, things to, to be examined more. Uh, Carefully. But thank you so much, Jeff, for your uh, call for uh, uh, appropriate response to, the, to populism. Uh, now I take uh, Akinari. You have the floor. Thank you, uh, Monsieur le Président. Um, I think I sh I I'd like to uh, discuss three things, um, uh, spending one minute for each. One is prospects for global economic growth. Uh, second is inflation, deflation. The third is uh, financial system. Uh, the first uh, growth prospect. Um, I think um, uh, average economists are very gloomy about uh, global economic growth uh, next year. But I'm, I'm perhaps somewhat more optimistic because at the moment there are three main elements which put downward pressures on economic growth of the world. One is, of course, US-China trade disputes. Um, they are not, not only reducing trade um, volume between the US and China, but also putting a damper on business investment uh, here and there. Uh, you know, China is trading partner uh, through an elevated uncertainty over business prospect. But, uh, well, as was agreed between Mr. Trump, uh, US and uh, China uh, yesterday or two days ago, I think, uh, you know, US will China will uh, strike a deal. I wouldn't call a permanent peace treaty or something. It's just a you know, temporary truce. But uh, I'm pretty sure Mr. Trump uh, understands the um, uh, this issue's implication for economic growth in the U.S. and uh, then uh, presidential election. So uh, 
this element will ease, in my view. I might be uh, too optimistic, but uh, this is first element. Second element is uh, rapid slowdown in uh, China's economic growth, uh, which is attributable, in my view, to uh, deleveraging hit there. I mean, uh, because of uh, you know huge debt accumulated there, Chinese authorities are smart enough to curb that trend, and. Uh, uh, you know, this one too, uh, this is a good thing actually for sustainability of China's economic growth long term, but putting a you know, damper short term. But this again, um, Chinese authorities seems a little bit concerned about, uh, you know, excessive downward pressure. And so in recent months, uh, monetary policy has been eased and also state controls on state-owned enterprises have been eased too. So uh, these two uh, negative elements tend to become uh, weaker a little bit. The third element, I think this is most important for e cyclical developments. You know, manufacturing in the world economy is, is, is in large part influenced by so-called silicon cycle, okay? Uh, production of IT goods and uh, machines are governed by cyclical forces uh, of inventory stocking and destocking. Uh, whose cycle consists, consists typically two years up and two years down. And uh, most uh, recent expansionary phase began in early 2016 and peaked in early 2018. So if the two years rule continues to hold good, then uh, it will be early 2020 or uh, you know, around the turn of the year uh, uh, that the cycle hits the bottom and begins to recover. Uh, so, uh, this is a good element, and uh, if 5G and uh, IoT development accelerates, then the economic bottom will come sooner, and the ensuing recovery will gain momentum. Uh, so, this, so much for economic growth uh, perspective, uh, uh, prospect. Low inflation. I think I did discuss uh, this issue uh, two years ago. Uh, you know. Uh, painful memories of uh, GFC to rankle in the memory in, in the minds of businessmen and uh, workers so uh, despite uh, you know good economic performance during the past few years uh, workers are still have some sort of sense of job insecurity and uh, corporate uh, businessmen are you know feeling some sort of uh, liquidity shortage might break up anytime soon or something like that uh, and also, I uh, discussed the uh, you know t global competition uh, put a damper on prices and IT AI revolution. And as I uh, did discuss two years ago, I think these momentums uh, not losing, but uh, uh, but slowing down. Um, China's influence over um, global deflation uh, coming to an end, in my view, uh, because of high wage increases in China, and also, uh, you know, U.S.-China uh, disputes perhaps uh, uh, will limit the uh, Chinese influence on prices in, in, in the U.S. and elsewhere. Okay. And IT revolution too. Well, IT revolution sort of thing is, uh, depends on regulation. Um, one, one footnote to this is, um, you know, inflation historically flared up when infl inflation psych psych psychology picked up. And uh, it's very difficult to analyze psychology of people, but uh, in this regard, I think 2020 presidential ele election may change the whole dynamics. Um, if the election ends with, with a progressive president, you know, we are all familiar with how you know, radically uh, U.S. politics changed in the past, from Jimmy Carter to Reagan and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So uh, if uh, 2020 U.S. presidential election uh, proves to be the same way, then um, uh, the new president will formulate, you know, left-wing uh, policies, including uh, universal health insurance coverage, which I think is a good thing for, for American people. But uh, 
it may change psychology of American people. Uh, to be more specific, uh, you know, uh, psyche may become more inflation prone. Um, like an episode in the mid 1960s, when the Johnson administration advocated guns and butter uh, policy, introducing Medicare and Medicaid in 1965, which invited a spike in prices in medical products, actually, and uh, triggering uh, psych inflation psychology then. Uh, so, so much for, um, for inflation. Financial system. Uh, this, is, this is the greatest concern of mine. Uh, to be specific, uh, huge debt has been accumulating, accumulated in the global market carrying negative interest rates. Uh, Japanese JGBs, European debts, um, not, you know, not just short-term paper, long-term government bonds and mid-term corporate, corporate bonds. Uh, negative interest rates are counterintuitive to me, although macroeconomists attribute, attribute them to deflationary expectations. Are they serious? Uh, I know no survey that supports the negative inflation uh, expectations over 10 years or longer. Um, in addition, you have to bear in mind that holding a fixed income asset carries risks of uh, not only inflation, deflation, um, uh, but also uh, many others, like uh, price volatility unrelated, to, uh, un unrelated with the inflation. Look, debtors, must, you know, debtors may default, so uh, you know, liquidity premiums should be paid there. And also, holders may die before maturity. So negative, negative, negative interest rates or negative yields really defy these risks, in my view. Uh, I think uh, investors simply hold uh, uh, long-term debts carrying negative interest rates for arbitrage gain. You know, uh, they hope to earn long, long before maturity, uh, wishing that uh, you know they could escape scot-free from uh, possible spikes in interest rates. Uh, such decision making based on uh, you know Keynes beauty con context beauty contest uh, creates a bubble if it bursts then a number of number of institutional investors will go under okay and they may entail a systemic run on asset management industry uh, because you know once investors run on bond sales some asset managers may f will face a shortage of liquidity in bond markets, which makes them difficult to execute the sell orders, okay, yeah. resulting into cash, cash shortage. So, you know, and remember, some of or more than a few uh, asset management companies hold assets under management over trillions, trillions of dollars. It's a huge problem. Now, viewed from a different angle, actually, I, I had discussed this uh, two years ago, too. I think... Kinori, uh, can, yeah. can I uh, ask yes. you, uh, am I right or wrong when I say, one, on global growth, you're relatively optimistic, a little bit more optimistic yes, than yes, the mainstream. Indeed. indeed. Second, on getting out of the very, very low inflation regime, you are reasonably optimistic too. Of course, the bet is that the new uh, present in yeah. the US will change a little bit, uh, the, turn the table, if I may. But all taken into account, you see the situation different from the very, very low uh, inflation that we have today, which is, of course, driving the central banks to be incredibly accommodating. Well, this uh, is it's what, what I understand from the yeah, second yeah. message. Well, yeah, this is what I... And paradoxically, on the third message, you're very pessimistic well, this is, this <laughs> as is, a number of us. Well, and you see the dramatic crisis looming. Well this, is, well, this is what I'm getting at, actually. Yes. You know, Japanese low interest rates, negative interest rates. Recently, who are the major investors? They are dollar-based investors. 
okay, particularly American institutional investors, buying JGBs at negative interest rates. Why? Because of uh, a wide spread between LIBO and OIS, uh, you know, or, or SOFA, wh whichever you call. You know, dollar liquidity shortage in the market. Why is that? Because major banks are reluctant to do market making activities because they really fear that uh, doing uh, you know, arbitrage on the LIBO and OIS, will, well, they have to expand their balance sheets, which requires huge capital, huge liquidity. Uh, as I said two years ago, Basel III and Dot Frank require too much of this kind of thing. Therefore, LIBO spread is wide there. So that from the viewpoint of American investors, on a swap basis, buying JGBs will, 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 will give them profits over U.S. Treasury holdings. So that's why, that's, that's a part of the reason that American banks, I don't know, American investors buying JGBs at deep negative interest rates. I take your point, like, you know, it's very, very interesting, oh. the element of speculation that you have on your market. Uh, we have a lot of American citizens here. <laughs> we would like very much to have their own sentiment on what's going on on the GGB market, so very, very stimulating. But could you conclude now? And yes, yes, please. So, so this kind of distorted uh, uh, regulations, on one hand, tight regulations on banks, and much less regulations on shadow banks, in particular asset management company, created uh, or, you know, make imbalances already there even worse. And uh, because of short-sighted, uh, uh, speculations are so widespread, it would unwind someday and possibly creating a fiasco in the system. So that's, that's my major concern. Yeah, it's very important. What you said is very important. I'm afraid we will find other pockets in the world, pockets of finance, pockets of markets, where we have also speculative abnormal behavior and bubbles. Uh, but yours, of course, is gigantic and very impressive. Can I turn to, I'm sorry. But behind this, of course, you know, too much emphasis is given by the central bank to anti-deflation policy, of course. The, the central bank are uh, the only game in town now in many, many countries, including, of course, Japan. It's very abnormal, very abnormal situation. And we will discuss, but I see a connection between Jeff remarks and your your own remark. But that being said, we turn to... Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Teresa. You have the floor. Uh, I'd like to make three points. The first point is that I think we all agreed that there's a synchronized slowdown and with the potential that we might have a recession. And there are minefield of triggers. There are all these geopolitical factors. Anything can trigger uh, some of the economy, pushing some of the economy into the recession. My question number one is that how can you cope with it? Uh, do we have the right tools to cope with that? You wanted to talk about monetary game and the basically monetary is losing its effectiveness and there's a good chance that when you, you know, lower your interest further and further down with the easy monetary policy, actually you create a big debt bomb down the road and there's a good possibility that we might end up financing the garbage project for all of those things, we're gonna pay the price. My more concern is on the fiscal policy. Yesterday, I guess, Oliver Blanchard mentioned that you know, because monetary policy is tied up in many countries, uh, fiscal might be the only game with the low interest rate. But with all this populism rising in many countries, everybody, particularly populist uh, politicians, are trying to win the election, and with a slowly growing or sometimes decreasing uh, high, I guess most of the fiscal policy run the risk of ending up uh, just give away rather than uh, spending in the more productive sectors or facilitate the structural investment. And the third thing is that during the you know, 2008 crisis, we have a global coordination. We all remember G20 played a very instrumental role. I remember that in 2009 in Seoul G20, all the leaders agreed to uh, stand still and roll back of all protectionist measures. And that helped a lot to avoid the worst outcome of the 2008 crisis. 
Now we don't have it. And we conveniently say, you know, so-called new normal about this low interest rate and all those stuff, but I don't think we can hide it behind this new normal about lack of international coordination. And this is very worrisome, particularly for countries in Asia, because you know, Asia has been following up globalization, and then we had a crisis 20 years ago with all this capital flow. And then we recovered, and you know, 10 years ago, we have this global financial crisis. But now, the question is that if the global coordination or the role of G20 is no longer there, if we have a crisis, where can you rely on? And fortunately, I'm very happy to tell that we have made a lot of progress. Uh, since the two, 20 years ago crisis, we have created something called, right now they call it RFA, Regional Financial Arrangements. Europe has ESM, Asia has come up with something called the CMIM. Basically, it's a multilateralized swap between ASEAN 10 countries and Japan, Korea, China. Uh, even though it's a work in the progress, we had made a lot of progress. But uh, at the same time, there are many missing uh, blocks, missing links in terms of the paid in capital because it's all promises, but there's no actual paid in capital, for example. And we don't know how to coordinate once the crisis hits us between IF, IMF and this regional financial arrangement and many bilateral swaps. So this is also a big concern for many Asian countries. And finally, uh, I just want to mention that you know, there is something called, we agreed under the G20, capital flow measures for macroprudential purpose. And in Korea's case, uh, in 2008 crisis, even though we had almost no exposure to US house mortgage market, and we, had, we are sitting on a pretty big amount of uh, reserve at the time, 20, $260 billion. Still, because we have a, a relatively large short-term debt, we are hit by the international investors. There was a pullout of money. It was only when we entered with the Federal Reserve uh, swapping range of $30 billion that the hemorrhage stopped. But actually, when you look at it, this short-term debt is not a really short-term debt. The large chunk of it is fictional debt. It's uh, sort of, a, I don't want to be too technical, but it's a, a forward sell position of foreign banks in Korea. So after that, we implemented two measures. Basically, we charge the bank levy. And you know, if it's a less than one year borrowing, in the, during the inflow stage, they have to pay additional 10 basis point. And another thing is that all those derivative positions should be linked and limited by the capital base. And with these two measures, what we found out is that the capital inflow does not change in terms of the amount, but basically the structure changed. So it's much more longer term. It's much more stable. And this kind of you know, capital flow measures for prudential, macro prudential purpose, I guess it should be more encouraged and explored. Uh, IMF is much more positive on that, OECD is a little bit uh, hesitant to, toward that, but I think you know, this is something without global coordination particularly, we have to uh, explore more. And finally about this, you know, we mentioned about this resetting of capitalism, and because of this perception or actual happening of inequality, I agree that we gotta do something about it, but what we found out is that we have an, now a little left-leaning government which emphasizes a lot about justice, fairness, equality. But it's all great in, in, in saying it as a cause, but when you try to implement it, you have this nightmare, who will define justice, who will define fairness? And so all these good intentions often end up with a pretty bad result. As they say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So I'm not saying the efforts is not worthwhile, but rather what I'm trying to point out, the, the risk, particularly on the populism, and trying to address this inequality issue, you try to push too far, and how to find the right equilibrium uh, is something we have to all struggle in each country. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. A lot of uh, potential questions for you in the discussion. André, you have the floor. Yeah, I, I would like to focus uh, on the state of the global financial industry 12 years after the crisis. 
uh, quickly. Uh, the U.S. In, is in very good shape, actually. The, the U.S. financial system is in good shape. There's no question about that. Uh, Europe, we have a problem. <laughs> After 12 years of regulation, or thanks to the CFS and Basel III, the, the balance sheets of the banks are in very good shape. The income statements are terrible. The, today, the market value, the market cap of the major uh, European banks is well below their net, as, their net book value. Uh, negative rates don't help at all, of course. So they are squeezed between regulation, which has been very, I think, slightly stronger in Europe than in the US to, be, to understate the, the, the situation. Uh, and uh, this credit situation, which is very difficult. I remind you that in uh, Europe, the banking system supplies 80% of the financing of the economy against 20% in the US. So it's very important in terms of the European economy. Second point, uh, we're facing, we, I say I'm no longer in the banking system, I'm on boards, but not uh, involved uh, directly. Uh, the, there is uh, the revolution which was started in 2008 was also the first iPhone. Uh, today, uh, we see a number of so-called neobanks, which raise amounts, huge amounts of money uh, trying to do the Amazon thing in banking. In other words, you get customers, you lose money for that, and you raise money, and you raise hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, and hoping that one day you'll make money. Uh, an example is N26, a bank which was started in Germany, now has a, has a European license, and just announced three and a half million customers. Uh, losing money all the time, of course. So the French banks and the European banks in general are really squeezed. Uh, I'm worried because they're the ones who supply funds for their growth. Two, they're cutting staff significantly, which I think they have to do. Three, they have to, ma to live with a legacy of computer systems which did not anticipate the smartphone. So may, we may have overshot to some extent in terms of regulation. If you add to that anti-laundering measures, I just uh, counted that in a small bank, I'm, I'm on the board of a small bank in France, 12% uh, of the staff is used only in, on money laundering and regulation questions, 12%. Uh, so uh, nothing, uh, is, the banking industry has never been uh, very popular. Uh, in that case, I think there is a risk that it can have a negative, negative impact on uh, on the European growth in the next uh, few months, actually. Thank you, thank you very I'm much. Under three minutes, I'm sure. It's true that uh, what you said, 80% uh, or 75% of the financing in Europe comes through banks. In the US, it's only perhaps 25, something like that. Uh, the idea that markets are much more reliable in time of crisis than banks is a wrong idea, of course. Liquidity can evaporate for markets and creates absolute blockade of the financing of the US. And then, of course, you have always the possibility for the central bank to reconstitute liquidity on markets massively. It is what happened clearly in the last crisis, and it might happen in the next crisis with a lot of, uh, uh, of course, uh, drawbacks and uh, major difficulty. But uh, thank you very much, André, indeed. I think that what you said uh, for the French banks is true for all European banks, I guess. And uh, what is the most striking, uh, but we have German citizens uh, in this working party, is that the most important uh, GDP by far of Europe, uh, the most important exporter of Europe, the most uh, brilliant uh, economy of Europe in terms of competitiveness, has a banking system which does not correspond at all to what we should normally observe. But we will perhaps discuss that with uh, the German friends. Uh, John, you have the, the floor. Thank you, Jean-Claude. I'm uh, predictably in, in the position that pretty much everything has been said, but not everyone has said it. So I will uh, try to differentiate a little bit but I think the main points have already been mentioned. Let me add one on uh, European banking. Of course, one of the side effects of the regulation has been 
effectively a seeding of the international capital market business, the investment banking business, to non-Europeans, essentially American banks. And uh, I, I don't think that was intentional, but it's certainly been one effect. Uh, I would uh, like to hope that Akinori is uh, correct in his optimism. Uh, as uh, the new managing director of the IMF pointed out in her inaugural speech last week, uh, as, we, uh, as the IMF gets ready to issue uh, its forecasts in the World Economic Outlook, uh, they find that 90% of world GDP is in economies that is slowing. Now, this, uh, I'm, we haven't seen the data. Uh, Japan has essentially been at full employment. The U.S. has been the only large economy growing above trend if we use the, the metric of falling unemployment rates. And the U.S. unemployment rate, as you probably saw, has now fallen to 50-year uh, lows, even though participation rates aren't as high as they were back then. And uh, what this suggests is that you're slowing growth in the EU, which is <clears throat> starting point below trend at this, at this time, and the major emerging economies, all the major emerging economies are, going to, are suffering at this time from a slowdown in growth. So it's worth asking what is the cause? Is there a common thread? And there are a couple. The principal one is weakness in fixed investment in capital goods equipment and the software. And that runs through virtually all economies and especially advanced economies. And it's worth asking, why is that occurring in a time in which monetary policy is aggressive, to, is accommodative to aggressively accommodative, and interest rates are at historic, generally at historic lows? Uh, it suggests some kind of deep uncertainty. And the fact that, as uh, I can already pointed out, a substantial amount of uh, the uh, <coughs> most important sovereign bond markets are now trading at negative yields is something I think that none of us ever anticipated could occur on a sustained basis. And I don't think we all understand it completely. How can this be possible? How can this be sustained? And what, it, what is the message? Certainly low inflation is, uh, is one of it. But given the outlook for growth, given or the consensus outlook for growth, given the likelihood if anything, that the fundamentals point to a weakening of energy prices and commodity prices, it's uh, somewhat hard to see uh, why at least inflation expectations are going to change substantially in the near term, and they could even uh, work, work, potentially work lower. So this is likely, to, there's every reason to think this very unanticipated and abnormal situation will, will continue. Let me switch then to the policy side, and or let me add, uh, we've seen a growth in concerns about things like regional inequality, regional sorry regional differences in growth rates within economies within countries, adding to inequality, and inequality in perceived as an increasingly important problem for economic policy. Things th also awareness that things like gender concerns, gender inequality, also undermines economic growth, plus concerns about climate. All these are important. I would maintain that these concerns uh, have been heightened by the sluggishness of growth. If, gro if growth was seemed more robust, these would seem less threatening. So let me just turn just briefly to, uh, to the policy uh, setting and just make the following simple points. Uh, I was happy to hear a mention of the G20. Uh, the, the initial G20 meeting in uh, November, at the leaders level, in November 2008 had four agenda items. One, restore, uh, restore global growth. Two, repair and reform the, inter the financial systems. Three, avoid new pr trade protectionism and promote new trade liberalization and four, reform the international financial institutions. And I would say the grading, if we were teachers grading the pupil, we would say incompletes on every single one of them. And there's, so the question is, is there a possibility for policy to make, in the near term, 
an important improvement in expectations and performance. And I would say very difficult at this time. One, a growing perception that we've seen that uh, monetary policy accommodation seems to have run its course and increasing feeling among monetary authorities that they have been, as Jean-Claude said, the only game in town, but that game is ending. I would uh, paraphrase, uh, everyone remembers Mario Draghi's remarks in London in August 2012 when he said, we'll do whatever it takes. He was referring to saving the euro. And he went on to say, and believe me, it will be enough. But not that many people paid such close attention when he spoke again at ja when he spoke at Jackson Hole two years later and said with regard to improving performance of the European economy, he said, we'll do whatever we can, and believe me, it won't be enough. <laughs> what he said was fiscal, fiscal, and monetary, uh, fiscal and structural policies are needed. But are those are those kinds of improvements likely? We still have the institutions, the G20, the Bretton Woods institutions, et cetera, that exist. They've been augmented by the regional finance uh, arrangements. But do we really think that the international safety net and the institutional framework that we have put in place is adequate to represent a bulwark against new dangers? And I would say incomplete as well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. What you said is very stimulating. Your summing up of uh, the program after the crisis and uh, the poor results. Uh, at least, of course, we avoided the equivalent of uh, the 30s uh, in the 20th century. And it was extremely likely. Uh, uh, what, what we did in the time and since then uh, corresponds to an underlying set of problems in the advanced economy in particular, which is really totally dramatic. Uh, and it's very difficult to understand the monetary policies of the central bank if we don't realize that we are in an extraordinarily demanding environment in the advanced economy. Because let's not forget, it was a crisis of the advanced economies. Uh, Hélène, I think you have the last word. <laughs> Please. Merci, Jean-Claude. Easy slot. <laughs> well, so I think, uh, for, as a macroeconomist, one underlying issue that has repeatedly come up and uh, that is a very important issue right now is why have a real rate so low? In a way, it, it underpins everything that most people have been saying. We don't understand exactly why they are so low. That constrains monetary policy massively. That is linked to the creation potentially of bubble and financial instability, and that puts huge financial risk, not only potentially in the banking sector, but also people have not talked about the insurance sector and the various types of asset managers, the pension funds, etc. So this is a really big issue. Um, now, what do we know about it? So uh, there are several uh, theories out there. Um, so one very prominent advocate of secular stagnation is, of course, Larry Summers. And uh, he will relate a decline in real rate to trends. And if he's right, then these trends are very persistent because they have to do with demography and uh, productivity growth. And of course, we can't predict innovation and all that. Uh, now, I happen to have done some research on this. And uh, I would tend to disagree with Larry Summers and to be much more on the Ken Rogoff side of things. I think that in order to understand long-term movements in real rates, one has to look at economic history. And then that's going to strike a chord with, uh, with Jeff and the 1930s. But actually, if you look at the, the long-term pattern of movement on real rates, uh, it turns out you can link them to other macroeconomic variables quite, quite closely, consumption and wealth and consumption wealth ratios. And what you see is that uh, really the only other episode that is similar to ours today is the 1930s, right? and it's the big crisis. And in both cases, you have seen massive increase in wealth in the 1920s, that was the Russian, you know, irrational exuberance period. We have seen that since the 1980s and, and 1990s, in both cases linked to financial deregulation and all that. Then we have seen massive financial crisis. And then after the massive financial crisis, we've seen very long period of deleveraging. And people underestimate how long it takes to deliver. And I think we are still in that, in that swing, in that, in, in that period of deleveraging, and this is why the real rates uh, tend to be uh, quite low. 
if this is correct, that also points to a fact, but I mean, if this is correct, that, that points to that fact, but for other reasons, I think uh, this is correct as well. Fiscal policy is the right tool right now. So fiscal policy is the right tool uh, because when the interest rates are low, fiscal policy is more effective. And of course, when interest rates are negative, if you have to do investment, it's the right time to do it. Do we have to do investment? Actually, we do. Everything we have, we have told today and, and yesterday about climate change and having to uh, do a transition requires a huge amount of private investment and public investment. So we're in the situation where, from a cyclical point of view, it looks like we should be investing. And for survival point of view, it looks like we actually should be investing. So everybody who says, you know, having a lot of debt or you know, having a, a deficit right now is not a prudent strategy. I would turn it on its head. It's the opposite, which is not prudent. We should really be investing a lot. Now, how do we invest? In order to invest, we need certainty. We need, you know, we need to get rid of some uncertainty, which is uh, very detrimental to investment behavior. We have a case experiment with Brexit. I won't dwell on that. But in terms of climate change, there's a lot of uncertainty. How do we go about that? What you want, and I think most economists who have worked on climate would, would agree here with me, you want a carbon price, and you want a deterministic price for a carbon price at long horizon. Okay? So here it's great that the chair is Jean-Claude, because I think there's one very great proposal, I think, out there by Christian Gaulier and Jacques Delplat, who proposes the creation of a carbon central bank, where the carbon central bank would actually sell permits okay, volumes of permit, in order to match them, and this requires the work of, of scientists in order to be able to do that properly, but it's possible to match our target of volume emissions into a deterministic path between now and 2050, say. The central bank can intervene by selling these permits at auctions and actually hit this, this path. Now, if you do that, and of course you support it also by public investment, you may unleash a whole amount of private investment and you may actually uh, do something positive about uh, what, we, what is needed for the energy transition. Obviously it is not costless. The carbon price will be biting. Okay? So that requires a lot of accompanying or distributive measures, etc. We know that. Energy transition is not gonna, it's not gonna be costless. But this would be a way of doing it um, while taking care of the uncertainty and unleashing investment. So I think this is something that would be really worth considering. Starting it in Europe seems very uh, kind of natural, but uh, with the appropriate mechanisms at the border to deal with import contents of carbon, I think we could make progress and maybe increase the club of people uh, adopting it down the road. Nale, fantastic. Uh, do, do you publish a paper? Have you published a paper, Hélène, on, on this uh, carbon central bank? The carbon central bank, it's not my idea. It's, a, it's the idea by Christian Gaulier, who uh, you might know is a, is, a very, is a very good academic, extremely good uh, uh, finance, insurance. He's at the Toulouse School of Economics and Jacques Delpla. Okay. And they have published a, a short note recently where they detail exactly how things would work. And it's really worth considering and, and reading. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So <laughs> we, are, we have a very rich set of ideas, proposals, uh, I would say fears. And uh, I see uh, much more fears, uh, to be frank, and, uh, and risks that could materialize than uh, highly positive uh, elements in what has been said. Uh, only uh, two or three remarks from me, uh, very, very short. Uh, I, um, I have to say that wh when I look at the picture from uh, Planet March, uh, I see populism, a level of frustration in uh, the uh, fellow citizens of, as you said very wisely, uh, Jeff, all uh, advanced economy without absolutely exception, even if the modalities are different, but it's the same in the US, UK, continental Europe, uh, Japan. That's, for one, an immense frustration of the population. Second, I see inflation extraordinarily low, and I cannot help making the rapprochement. I, I think that there is an anomaly in the functioning of our system, which is that the Phillips curve does not function as in the past since the crisis, 
and that even when you have full employment, uh, there is no real increase of the uh, uh, wages and salaries. The fellow citizens prefer by far uh, to protect their jobs instead of getting uh, augmentations of wages and salaries. And that is because they are under uh, an immense new competition constraint coming from globalization, the emerging countries, uh, and uh, science and technology, not to speak of perhaps uh, immigrants in, in their own uh, national economy. So all this makes something which is abnormal. It's abnormal in my view that in Germany you do not have, you, it's starting a little bit now, but uh, over a long period of time you didn't have what would have been expected from social partners in uh, full employment, so the same in the Netherlands, the same in Japan, same in Switzerland, same in certain way in the US with the paradox that the Republican president calls for the blue collars to get more wages and salaries, which says a lot on the overall sentiment that there is something wrong there. Uh, if they were more demanding, I'm not sure that the real wages and salaries would increase a lot because you have other fundamental constraints uh, that are uh, underlying and uh, uh, we all know that. But at least we would have unit labor cost going higher. And with unit labor cost going higher, inflation would be higher. So, so I have, uh, we, we are in a Phillips curve which is Keynesian, which is no more uh, of a, a classic, if I may, Philip uh, Kearns. And, and then perhaps the central bank would be out of the fear, right or wrong, they have the fear that the deflationary risk could materialize. And this is the reason why in this environment of very low inflation, they try to get out of this trap. But, and I dare myself, I, I will be as daring as Ellen was. Uh, I know what happens when the system does not function very well and when wages and salaries are permanently fixed at a too high a level. You engage with all partners in some kind of disinflation policy. It is what has been done in the Netherlands, in Europe, in France, after the Netherlands, and uh, in many other countries, uh, as a matter of fact, all countries, in order to converge towards the euro. So it was uh, social partners, government, public authorities, private sector, joint partnership to arrive from increases of, uh, say, 7 8% down to increases which would be in line with more or less the 2% of the uh, inflation target, implicit target. And I am wondering whether we would not need to deliver the central banks from the trap and all the consequences in terms of financial instability that are associated with negative rates or very low, low rates, whether we should not try to have the reverse consensus, if I may, not disinflation policy, but policies in a way. It is what Trump says. When he says, I'm president of the US and I want the blue colors to get more wages and salaries, it seems I see something which looks a little bit as the reverse of what we did. And uh, I participated myself in the disinflation policy over 17 years in my own country. And, and the euro would not exist had we not embarked in this uh, policy. So but now I have been much too bold. And I think it would be excellent to have a, a sequence of uh, remar remarks, comments, questions, observations. So please, fantastic. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. You've mentioned Germany a couple of times, and so I, I thought I'd, uh, I, I, I'd bring in the German point of view. I'm Austrian, so I can say uh, things that the Germans don't like to hear, nonetheless. Um, so about the German banking system, yeah? So there is, there's a narrative that I hear all the time. They say, oh, the uh, interest rates are so low, uh, and the margins are so low, and then there's regulation that doesn't allow us to, to uh, take fees. Uh, and, and that squeezes our, uh, our income statements. So I think that is, there is some truth to that.
But um, uh, what is much more striking in, in, in Germany really is that uh, the amount of uh, deleveraging that we've already talked about was just immense. You know? And uh, the IMF has criticized uh, the Germany, Germany's uh, family-owned uh, companies recently. This gave rise to almost uh, rebellion. No? Uh, they don't, didn't like it at all. But uh, those family enterprises have financed the investment they did almost entirely out of returned, of returned uh, profits. Uh, and not uh, going to, to their banks, what they did uh, typically over the history of German capitalism, or, or go to, to, to uh, public markets. So it's re retained earnings. And um, uh, inf uh, investment per se has been low. So the little investment that has taken place was, was financed by uh, retained profits. So that's, that's the, the first thing. The second uh, comment I'd like to make is that we are, we are in, in Germany now in the process of uh, getting serious with the carbon price for the non-ETS uh, segment. So for uh, uh, cars, for transportation, and for buildings. And the uh, idea of a, a CO2 central bank uh, is quite present in the discussion. I'm happy to hear that uh, Gaulier uh, has written about that, but it's also, it's also part of the proposal of my institute, and it's uh, part of uh, something that uh, the PIC Institute, the big climate change think tank in Berlin, has advocated. So there might be something that uh, we should pursue. Uh, French and uh, German economists. And the, th the third point um, about the, the Phillips curve. So there's an interesting observation. It's also just a couple of weeks old. There's been a revision in the uh, German national accounts, and that shows that uh, today uh, the share of wage income over GDP is where it was in 1992. So we had actually a relatively uh, strong recovery of the share of wages in, in national income from 2010 to today. So there has been wage growth. At the same time, the capital share has been squeezed, and that you know, so that's maybe another side effect of low interest rates or of low, of low capital costs. So that uh, that uh, in total value added, uh, more could be paid out to to uh, to workers without prices going up because the additional wage cost has been absorbed by by firms. So these are three points. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. And forgive me if I, I, I was alluding to the German citizen. Uh, yeah, please. Thank you very much. Uh, allow me, please, uh, to speak in French to be uh, very concise and very precise. Uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, no, I'm sorry, because we have no translation. You have no so, translation. So, uh, uh, Unfortunately, there I, is. I, I will try, but I beg your pardon uh, for my broken English. Uh, what? <laughs> no, I, I will. Uh, I, I will try in English. If you, you, you try I, English, I, I'm sorry to say that as a French, I, I'm ashamed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but you can. <laughs> no, there are two or three ideas. Uh, I'm very impressed, but uh, Ellen, ideas of. Uh, Carbon Central uh, Bank. Yesterday uh, we heard uh, about uh, the amount of uh, currencies circulating uh, in, 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 in the in the world. I uh, uh, read uh, some weeks ago about some lo very localized currencies to uh, enhance. Uh, Circuit court, uh, very short circuits. Uh, do, do you think, I, I, I'm just asking, I have a question, I have not an idea to propose to this uh, distinguished uh, panel, but uh, my question is uh, today, uh, and also we, uh, my opinion is uh, the, the, the trade war, dispute uh, between uh, United States and, uh, uh, and China is uh, uh, sous uh, uh, by uh, currency underlined by uh, uh, currency war uh, also is those ideas is today uh, can the world is the world uh, ready for uh, international Central Bank. I, I, I see what you mean. I see the question. 
uh, it seems to me that we, we cannot speak of currency wars when, when the renminbi is itself not a convertible currency. So uh, at this stage, the renminbi is not yet in, at the core of uh, the international system. Still, of course, uh, it is a currency which is uh, very, very closely managed, and in a way, it is a currency but, which... But Trump, Trump has declared that at least part of the currency war is with the EU. I mean, his view is, and, and you, you can see the, the logic of it, his view is that um, the, the ECB's monetary policy, from the standpoint of the U.S. and international markets, is uh, aimed at keeping the euro weak and keeping the dollar strong. And, you know, if you can look at the Big Mac index and see that we have an unprecedented circumstance in which basically every currency in the world, except uh, Norway's krona and the Swiss franc, is substantially undervalued, quote unquote, relative to the dollar. So, so there is, I mean, tr in Trump's mind, there's a currency war and it's with Europe. Yeah, but, but I, I would totally disagree, of course, both with Trump and with the... Uh, I, realize, uh, I realize that, but I'm just saying, if you want to understand the nature yeah. of the conflict, yeah, yeah, right, it's yeah. important to understand what I, the I, I take source is. Of course, of course. So do we have other comments on that, that particular point? Yeah, please. Uh, you want to respond to some of the panelists. So I think uh, let me first check whether we have other questions from the participants that are not speakers. Yes, you have the floor. This is not a question, just comment uh, on the chairman's discussion about the coordinated approach to inflation or deflation. And we had a very good experience in the 1970s where uh, government just requested just uh, you know, lowering the increase in wage and that kind of income policy. But uh, we did the same effort this time on the opposite direction. I mean, the Prime Minister just mentioned many, many times to the private sector to raise wage, but never successful. So uh, there seems to be some kind of uh, asymmetry uh, about just uh, decrease or increase uh, for this kind of policy. And also, one more point. Uh, many people just say because just the interest rate is so low, there's no opportunity for more uh, monetary policy, so why not just uh, fiscal policy? Now, let me just mention the case of Japan. We did have a very strong monetary policy, but because of that, maybe the f f almost full employment, so demand is enough so far in Japan. The problem is just the total factor productivity growth rate is shrinking. So obviously, it just means supply side policy become more important. The problem is supply side policy is very difficult because the government reach is very much limited. So without discussing supply side policy or at least just uh, increasing productivity, especially in the face of the declining real interest rate, uh, we can just get out of this kind of difficulty. Maybe demand stimulation is necessary under circumstances of sudden decrease of the global demand, but still supply side is so important at this moment. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for these remarks. Please. Yes, uh, thank you. We, uh, we have uh, very interesting ideas and suggestions and uh, obviously innovation in finance today. But just I'm wondering about the way we can sell some ideas to politicians we have today and what kind of politician we have, what kind of dialogue we can have. When you talk about inflation, and uh, we understand today that the weakness of the union in different countries and politicians. Uh, this is what we have, the case of GM in the United States. About the, and it's very interesting to observe the way maybe this something is going on, it is new, it is going on. But it is, if we have this, those ideas, and it is, it's for me, it is, I would say, very interesting technical, uh, I would say, proposal or suggestions or adaptation to the situation today, but who will apply those policies? It is politicians. And what is the, the link we have and we can have with politicians today, and if we come back to the crisis of 2008, it was completely different because we have some, I would say, uh, leadership, world leadership we have, and it was said that today we don't have this kind of leadership. It is, completely different, it's diluted in between different persons with different, completely opposite uh, ideas. This is what, the, this is a question mark we have. 
This Thank is you. a pure brainstorming <laughs> session. Uh, again, I made the rapprochement between the populism and the political pressure, gigantic political pressure on the political sphere. So uh, there are leverage, or there is leverage, uh, to perhaps to go in the direction that uh, uh, wages and salaries could be more dynamic. Uh, and to the uh, Japanese example, I would also say I fully agree that if you want to have the various corporate businesses on board, it has to be done nationally and also within some kind of framework, international framework. And it happens, it is a miracle, that all central banks of the advanced economy have now the same definition of price stability, namely 2%. So it could be an argument at the level of the G7, whatever, at the level of the G20, uh, to, to go further. But again, uh, I dare say that because I said we have the right to do anything, to say anything. Please, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, only yesterday and today, I suppose the most often heard words were the US-China trade conflicts. If you see that in the, in the context of or in, uh, in relation with uh, underlying hegemonic competition, then I think in this session, very session, finance and economy should be uh, really more worried about the uh, global order and international economic cooperation. Uh, uh, so in that regard, I would like to make uh, observation and comments. Uh, since G20 was mentioned uh, a number of times here, I suppose uh, today uh, some uh, the uh, uh, economists or political economists uh, tend to go as far as to say that the world is in danger of uh, falling into uh, interwar period of uh, what is called the Kinderberger trap. Uh, what that means is the global economy will suffer from not enough uh, public goods, and therefore the world economy will suffer very much from it. Now, the U.S., particularly under the uh, Trump administration now, and according to our discussions all day yesterday and today, even the, the, uh, after Mr. Trump, uh, the similar sociopolitical and the uh, geopolitical uh, situation will, will, will last. If that is the case, uh, the U.S. will be unwilling to provide the public co the goods as uh, it did before while China is also incapable to some extent and uh, unwilling, then there is much high likelihood that the world will suffer from much shortage of public goods and uh, may lead to even the Kinderberger trap, if not to see that this uh, trap. Now, so to avoid this trap and avoid this situation, the global community needs closer international cooperation. Who can do that without the uh, hegemonic uh, the, uh, leader? So that in that connection, I suppose G20 can be uh, considered because that is a legitimate uh, the forum for international cooperation. And uh, it has a track record. As John, uh, we worked very closely, in fact, uh, throughout the G20 endeavors from the very beginning of the G20 endeavor in Washington, D.C. When G20 was created, of course, there was shared the sense of let's not waste crisis. And uh, Chancellor Merkel actually first uh, said exactly in that terms. And uh, with, with, with that 
the uh, shared sense, uh, G20 achieved much. It's a re record of, uh, of uh, saving the world, falling into a great depression-like uh, situation, and it helped make the global economy only suffer what you call great recession. And then G20, in fact, the last G20 meeting, I personally was very, very disappointed, and uh, G20 could have done much more. And John knows very well, it, when it was designed, it was supposed to be ev the uh, process, not event, not photo taking event, coming up with just, you know, rhetorics, but should, should have been the uh, uh, continuous process which really the world needs at this very moment and the uh, coming years. So uh, what, I, what I would like to uh, say is that somehow we have to resuscitate or re the, uh, revitalize the process. I suppose if U.S. is not willing and China is uh, incapable, then I suppose like-minded countries, particularly middle powers, I think they, you know, they can do something about it. And the next chair country, I understand, is uh, the, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, and followed by the Italy. I think uh, they can do something and the revital so that we can uh, Thank you. save Thank the uh, Thank uh, you very much. falling into Kinderberg trip. It's important that we are on the record, of course to mention that I guess there is a very large consensus here to say that multilateralism is of the essence more, even more now than before, that you're absolutely right. What we have, the, the best informal grouping that exists for that is the G20. It was substituting to the G7 in the occasion of the crisis, the, the G7 accepted that the baton of the uh, most important and pertinent informal grouping was the G20. You're absolutely right to mention that the G20 has positives and negatives. Uh, on the positive, I would nevertheless mention the fact that the work which is being done in Basel, the work which is being done in the Financial Stability Board, goes through a lot of mechanism through the international financial institutions that are very important in all this mechanism, then to the G20, and this consensus of various rules, regulations, standards are stamped by the G20 even today. So we cannot say that it does not exist or it does not do the job. We, we can say it's not sufficient, you are forget, you're, you're concentrating on the banks, but you are forgetting the non-banks, as has been said by a, a number of us. You, you can say a lot of things, but st it is still there, it still functions, and is, it still produces, in my opinion, uh, value added in the global governance. Where we have a failure, in my opinion, and John might have uh, a sentiment on that, is that on the coordination of macro policies, doesn't work. And uh, uh, the Secretariat is the IMF for this particular part of the G20 franchise, and it's true that it is not at all encouraging. And of course, the fact that uh, the President of the US himself says, I, the hell with the uh, multilateralism and so forth. Still, he was participating in my memory in the G20, in the G7, and uh, with some kind of uh, perhaps erratic behavior. Uh, he, was ne he was nevertheless physically present and uh, the, uh, the, the US did not withdraw from the G20 or the G7. So uh, I don't want to be, to be optimistic because we have a lot of good reasons to be very pessimistic. What I know in advance, and it is ridiculous, when we have the new crisis, then you will see the G20 very active and doing a lot of things with the sword in the back, uh, clearly. And it, it, it was exactly what happened in uh, 08 or 09. Huh? It was exactly that. 
when you have the sword in the back, you react, and uh, you are doing uh, crisis management more, uh, I would say, uh, in a way which has been, uh, of course, uh, with a lot of defects, but we avoided the, the absolute drama. That being said, I also draw as a provisional conclusion that we have a large consensus to think that there is a probability of materialization of a very grave new crisis. And uh, that, that is, of course, something which is also very important in our meditation. But Daniel, you had asked for the floor. Let me ask you something. So, uh, I, I believe that um, the, the economic slowdown will continue. Um, I believe also that uh, we are kicking the can down the road. I mean, we need to be much more um, frank and say, we do not know. This is a stark reality. Uh, and this is why there are people who are thinking, look, in the end, we'll resort to helicopter money, not only for the sake of uh, raising the inflation rate, which has become an obsession. It's like inflation targeting is how to create inflation. It's not about price stability. <laughs> it's about creating inflation. That depends no, no, if no, you... I'm saying it, no, I'm saying it, I, I, I'm overshooting, but, but now secondly, uh, I think we will avert uh, um, a big crisis next year because uh, sort of desperation, the resumption of QE, it's, it's reality already. Uh, the talk about uh, a new fiscal stimulus, especially where uh, economists can undertake it, where the central banks are reserve currency providing banks and, and, and where there is fiscal space. Uh, what I fear, and as you emphasized, President Trichet, is, um, is the liquidity issue, uh, the Keynesian trap. QEs are basically injection of base money, never in history probably. I mean, we replaced quasi-money created by commercial banks with, ba with base money. Never in modern history we had so, so huge introduction of base money in the systems. And we still fear sudden stops because liquidity can disappear all of a sudden, like water in the sand. And I'm asking myself, if there will be a correction, a massive correction on the stock exchange. Sorry, so what, what could disappear? Uh, I mean, liquidity can very easily disappear. I mean, there are companies which, which sit on on massive amounts of liquidity. They don't, and, 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 and what happened in the repo market in the United States shows, I mean, the fear of not having enough liquidity. So this is an issue. Who can provide liquidity when a, a new crisis strikes? Who? The Fed again, the ECB, the IMF. Can the IMF run? That question, it's, it's pretty questionable. And this is why when Mark Carney came with the idea of create, now, Secondly, investment. John, you're right. But there is, as Mervyn King said, uh, radical uncertainty. Companies are not going to make investment, private companies. Even if we uh, come up with uh, a carbon tax. I mean, it's a price, but there are many prices. There are many, no, no, I mean, I, I can. We, we want to change the way we think about it. The future, I, I agree. But I'm talking about radical uncertainty and, and, and the very low propensity to invest. Then it's only the only governments. Government can undertake massive public investment. Uh, then, then yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. And, and we, last, we then, have then, only then, the, seven and, minutes from the, the, the interruption of the meeting. It. So, do, do you have another idea that you could uh, float? And what I think about Libra, why I think it should be stronger regulated. I think the central banks and regulators are fully entitled to be more than. Uh, cautious in accepting Libra and other similar assets. Because Facebook and other entities are huge. They can provide services to billions and billions. I take your yeah. point, and I expect, we did not discuss the cryptocurrencies and all the 
extraordinary uh, ideas that are floating here and there, and the token, the crypto token, and Libra, and so forth. I know, Hélène, that you have very strong position because everybody heard it. Uh, and uh, I, I think that you, perhaps you could say a word when you are the r rapporteur for our uh, meeting, perhaps uh, you, you, could, you could say a, a word on that because, uh, because I, I, I think that what you, you said publicly and we all heard, heard it, it was very stimulating. And I must say, I share very much the view of Daniel. Uh, that there is something which is very dangerous there. Okay, so we have two more questions. Yes, please. And there's, there's one thing which I don't fully understand. Um, listening to Laurent Fabius um, and Puyane this morning, listening to the conversation that uh, Jeffrey Fried and, and Bertrand introduced today, it looks to me that the pricing of carbon could be a very simple way to introduce rationality in decisions. So if you increase it massively, then things will change. Why don't we do that even before creating a central bank? Uh, <laughs> that's a very good question, but I'm afraid we would spend quite a lot of time on it. The but point of a central bank is precisely to have a target price, and you yeah. don't want a price on your spot price. You want a whole path, which is what the central bank could do very beautifully, like with inflation targeting. So good luck with that. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> But, but, but a lot of other questions, I guess, because what do you do with the immense coal production of the Chinese? How would we impose the, the price? You have to, to, to have import con, con, carbon import content at the border, which is also something discussed in the document and maybe you know, also in, in the proposal. I, then it would be very good that you would circulate the reference uh, in order for us to plunge in the meditation. Uh, thank you. Please, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I sat up in my chair when I heard Jeff Frieden talk about uh, sanctions because um, the Trump administration has basically only sanctions and tariffs as foreign policy tools. Then Jeff knocked me off my chair by saying he uh, foresaw the possibility, uh, distinct possibility of 1930s conditions coming in. Jeff, could you elucidate on both points? Okay, well, I had uh, a couple of things in mind. The first is the collapse of cooperation in the 1930s, which was both cause and effect of the rise of mass dissatisfaction with the way that existing elites and existing political institutions and political parties had dealt with a crisis. So we have to understand that you've got a, 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 a bubbling up of discontent on the part of mass publics throughout the world. and. An, in, in an, an inadequate response. And that's, in a way, that's what we think of as happening in the late 20s and early 1930s. It's interesting to note, by the way, and, and I don't mean this to say we are now in the 1930s, although I think there are some indications. I, I, I agree completely with Alain that, that this is a classic Rogoff Reinhardt style debt, debt crisis. Their average is five to seven years for recovery. The Europeans have, you know, in typical European fashion, done it so well that it's taken 10 to 14 years to recover. The credit channel is completely blocked. And, and all of the indications that people have given are, are, go along those lines. But, but to take the metaphor, and it is just a metaphor or analogy, I never know the difference. The, take the analogy a little bit farther, you know, think back to what happened in the 1930s. In the 1930s, one set of countries, one set of governments undertook really decisive action in response to these mass demands and declared a bank holiday, basically in, decreed an industrial policy put five million unemployed to work, um, ran for the first time in American peacetime history massive budget deficits, it took the dollar off gold. All of these major, uh, uh, um, major measures on the part of the Roosevelt administration. And then there's another group of countries that did something very, very similar. The Nazis, as Keynes said in 1936 in his introduction to the German edition of, of general theory, the Germans, have, he's sorry to say, and he's very apologetic about it, Germans have done exactly what I would have done in these circumstances. So I guess the point that I'm trying to make is either we, I don't know who we is, I'm an academic, either people who actually are, are likely to take this in a cooperative, um, sort of a progressive, let's call it, direction, and I very much like the ideas that Ellen floated and that, uh, that Bernard floated, Either people take, either political leaders take it in a progressive direction, or it's going to be taken from them 
by the populists who are not going to give up when they fail. They double down. You know, if, if the Trump administration is unsuccessful in providing what its constituents want, they're not going to declare defeat and say, well, let's go back to the status quo. They're going to say it's all because of the, the bad international bankers and the multilateralists and the Chinese and the Europeans. And if we only raise tariffs another 25 percent, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there really is a, a sense in my mind of a bifurcation, just as there was in the 1930s. You can go in a social democratic direction in 1930, or you can go in a fascist direction. There really was no other choice. And I think at this point, people have to recognize that this is not just another recession, just like it was not just another uh, um, uh, cyclical crisis. There is a fundamental questioning of the very foundation stone of the post-war international economic order. And it's not coming from the developing countries. It's not coming from China. It's not coming from the, the Soviet Union. It's coming from, in some cases, majority populations in the advanced industrial countries, or populations that are willing to stand behind political leaders that are promising results that, that re require essentially undoing the international economic order as we know it. So that's sort of what I would call sort of, I mean, if I want to think about it, a, a call to action. The call to action is, you know, we have these long-term trends that have left many behind. They want answers. And we keep responding to those long-term trends by saying, well, the answer is education. The answer is infrastructure. The answer is a variety of other things. That's not the answer people's want, people want. And I'm not a politician. I'm just an academic. But politicians, what we need is politicians who can provide an, a po politically attractive alternative that takes our countries in a direction that's acceptable to our people. And right now, we don't have that. And I think that the time is very dangerous. Sorry for the we, we, <laughs> we, we, I think, all agree that the time are very dangerous. but. From time to time, I am thinking, the US is the very place where populism is erupting and taking a dominant position. And maybe it will go on and on. What is the current account uh, of the US? Minus 3.5% of, the, if I'm not misled, of the GDP. So the US already spent much more than it earns and when you look at the monetary policy, she's extremely, it is extremely accommodating, obviously taking into account full employment. When you look at the fiscal policy, it's already extraordinary. So the recipe, if there is a recipe, is of a totally different nature from what was done in the 30s, it seems to me. Because there you had to embark in a very strong I would say, ultra-accommodating fiscal and monetary policy, but, but then it's already done in our case. So, so what's behind? I mean, we have no time. But the, the question is, what do you suggest, sir? You're an academic. You have all rights to suggest anything to the political sphere. And I think Akinari wants the last word. <laughs> Please, well, Akinari. Analogy with the 30s is perhaps irrelevant at this moment simply because you know, in the 30s, the major problem was unemployment in the US, Japan, and uh, Germany. Now, uh, Japan, US, unemployment rate is lowest during true. the past half century. Absolutely true. So the major problem is low wage increase. Mm. So why don't we address uh, policies, you know, directly to that? That's incomes policy, as uh, Motoshiga suggested. I agree. I and, agree. And it didn't work because it was not structured well enough. I, you know, yeah, for, for those who learn or studied economics in the 70s, we are familiar with TIP, uh, meaning tax-based incomes policy. Sidney Weintraub and Henley Wallach. Of course, Henley was uh, governor of the Federal Reserve Board in those days and who was a regular visitor to, 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 to Basel when I was working yeah, there, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. But anyway. So uh, why don't we revisit TIP, uh, tax-based in, tax incomes policy? It's, a, it's an idea. This is brainstorming. So, <laughs> yeah. One sentence that I didn't mean to suggest that the conditions were, the economic conditions were similar. The problems are very different. But the fact that we face in some ways a crossroad or a, or a, a fork in the road, I think are, are very similar. And I think that the kinds of ideas that people have been throwing around, whether it's universal basic income or tax-based incomes policy or the, the carbon price, all of these things 
are things that I, as, academic, as an academic, would encourage politicians to start thinking about and talking about, because if we don't come up with some alternative, I think we are in, in real trouble. I think it's uh, le mot de la fin, if I may. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you all for this very, very fruitful discussion.